Kind of having a bad day, Alex. I lost my new interior decorating job. I was working on a kitchen, and I lost it. The dining room, actually. What happened? I don't want to talk about it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let Jump and Jeff Farmer tell you what happened. Jeff? Me. You turned the tables in a wrong way. See? <laughs> they should have told me which way to turn it. I don't know. Uh, Let's do the damn thing. Those are kind of the details you need to get before you start a job, though, don't you think? I know. I would have turned it the right way if they had told me, but... Good evening, and welcome to episode number 26 of Slash Tracks Action News. I'm Alex Vanover. And I'm Josh LaRue. Uh, Josh, very excited to be back in the studio. Uh, we had a little bit of a layoff because I relocated to a different city. Uh, so we had to move the entire Slash Tracks studios and my prison cell and the Rodeo Clowns barrel all the way to another part of Oregon, man. So I'm back. Did you have to get a hazmat team uh, to move the uh, barrel? I didn't touch the barrel. I had the clown move it himself. Um, but he was looking in the yellow pages. Uh, funny, or funny, you know, funny thing you mentioned that. He was looking in the yellow pages, and he wanted to find a hazmat crew. And we had a couple of them come out for estimates, and nobody uh, would give him a decent quote because it was a lot of work. Yeah. Uh, just a lot of work. Um, and the people who... <laughs> The people who were willing to work with it, who gave them like a fair quote, had no experience with barrels. So, and for all you people that are wondering what the hell we're talking about on our show, Slash Tracks, it's an homage to Mystery Science Theater 3000. We are not only tormented by an evil villain, but he has placed a rodeo clown in who's very annoying, lives in a stinky barrel. He placed that in Alex's dungeon. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. That's, yeah, that's the life of Alex. <laughs> he's my roommate that Master Evil uh, snuck into my prison cell in the middle of the night. I didn't even know. It, it was like Saw. It was like the movie Saw. I just woke up one morning <laughs> when I was chained to the wall after one of our Slash Tracks episodes, and uh, he was there. Uh, Josh, are you excited for episode number two of The Express? I'm ready. I even got a headline lined up for later. Hell yeah, dude. But that's teamwork. We're making the dream work. We're working together here in unity. Unity, yep. baby. Unity! High five. All right. All, right. All right, Josh. Let's get into uh, let's get into a nice comment. All right, let's do it. All right, man. I am a huge riffing fan. I've seen every MSTK3, even season zero, and I enjoy riff tracks and CT riff. Your cheesy wraparounds were on point. The riff was fantastic. I laughed a lot. I wish you guys didn't have to use the Google Drive link, but I believe one day... You'll be right up there with MST3K, CT, and Riff Tracks. And that is from our friend, Has a Begun Dogda. <laughs> Has a Begun? Has a Begun Dogda, 4144. And that is in regards to Slash Tracks, episode number 35, Final Destination 3. So that's our latest episode of Slash Tracks. Yeah, that was a lot of fun. Uh, yeah. Man, I don't. Uh, I think CT is like a Colorado ripping team or something. I think I've seen that before, but I haven't seen them. Um, I do know, but I do know, Josh, that we are listed in the actual internet data database of uh, TV shows uh, of like MST3K, uh, you know, clones or MST3K homages. We are professionally listed on their, you know, their list and their website. So that's, that's pretty cool. That is awesome. And, you know, uh, has it begun or begun? Um, we actually have a season zero as well. 
uh, episodes one, two, three, four, and five. Um, we were still kind of finding the format, so we kind of designated that season zero. Season three, we're about halfway through, I believe. It may be a shorter season, but uh, there's some fun stuff ahead. Howling three is the next one. Howling Thanks three. Uh, I've never even seen Howling one or two, so I'm really looking forward to see what happens in number three. And Mikey is going to be uh, jumping in, and he's he uh, he donated to the channel, and he did it at a tier where he actually gets to uh, jump in on the riff a little bit with us. So that's going to be interesting. Mikey Clark, our boy, your friend and mine, he's going to jump into the saddle, and he's going to be able to riff the shit out of the Howling 3 with you and I. Uh, Josh, mean oh, comments. Oh, mean, mean comments. comments. Okay. Yeah. Uh, don't quit your day job. And that's oh. from... Doric Ka Rahman two nine seven seven in regards to slash tracks number thirty five Final Destination three. Well, you know what? I am really surprised that he knew about my day job, but supported my day job so much that he wants me to stay there uh, longer. Uh, so thank you for that. That's a very that's actually a positive comment. I will not quit my day job. Thank you. Um, how does he know this isn't our day job? Because we always bitch about not getting paid. <laughs> <laughs> um, in regards to him telling me not to quit my day job. Uh, duly noted. Won't do it. Uh, not until uh, we blow the fuck up. How about that? So thanks for the advice. I appreciate the positive direction that you're trying to provide for us. And if you could comment real quick, we would love to see uh, any of your uploads that have uh, 60 to 110,000 views. Um, we'd love to drop a comment. Oh, you don't have any? What's this? <laughs> breaking well, it, news. It's, it's it's breaking news. It was a it was an asshole troll that uh, could never do even what we've done so far. So, I was gonna say I'd love to see his show and be able to give him some positive feedback because I mean he I I want to return the favor because he did it for us. I I only feel it's right to balance out the universe and to be able to yes, give him balance, some feedback too. Balance. I mean uh, balance. Balance it out. Yep. Yeah, we could have a dude. We could have an old, old-fashioned Texas three-way Texas tornado match. Me and you versus him. Let's do it. Ding, ding, yeah. ding. Yep. Uh, all right, Josh. Uh, can you please plug our Patreon? Yes. Wait. Which one? <laughs> what do you mean? Which patron do I have to plug? Are they? Okay oh, come on. Well, we already plugged Michael Clark. How about uh, Johnny Utah? <laughs> no, go, go for it. All right. Uh, right up above, you can find uh, either the email or the Patreon link, which is patreon.com forward slash 80 slash your librarian, because I can't change it to slash tracks right now. And down below, you can find our email or above, I don't know, slash tracks 2020 at gmail.com. What can they send us over there uh, to that email, Alex? Uh, at slash tracks 2020 at gmail.com, they can send us questions for Dear Slashy. Uh, they can ask for advice. Uh, they can, if, they, if they're a company, if they're a person, they want to sponsor one of our episodes or future content. Uh, if they want to just talk to us about life or they have questions that, you know, aren't too personal, I guess, maybe they can ask us. We're really good about responding to the people that watch the shows. Uh, I feel like that, I feel like of all the YouTube channels, uh, you know, we're, we're at like almost 41,000 subscribers. I would say that we're pretty hands-on with uh, the fan base. Yeah, um, yeah, very accessible. Yeah, we're very accessible. So, if anybody has any questions for like, would you rather for a future episode? If you want to be featured in a future uh, podcast news episode, or if you have a dear slashy question and you want some advice from Josh and Alex, we would be happy to give it to you. Please send your questions, your ideas, your concerns, whatever to slash tracks two thousand twenty at gmail dot com. And if you're a company and you want to sponsor future content, go ahead and get a hold of us there as well. And uh, if you want to bitch us out and call us names and tell us not to quit our day job, that's fine, too. And uh, if, you, if you don't want to join the Patreon but you want to help the channel, you can go to paypal.com and you can do a channel donation to daylighter07 at yahoo.com. It's in the description below, uh, probably in the comments, too. Uh, but on Patreon, uh, you get some cool ebooks and some exclusive content. We're going to be doing Skype chats this summer. Uh, with all the patrons, and they will be uploaded to YouTube as well. So check it out. Yeah, yeah. I think the the Skype chats that we're gonna do, we had had those planned uh, for a few weeks back, but as we all know, 
uh, I relocated to a whole new city. So I've been moving. And so Josh has kind of been holding things down for the last two weeks. So Josh, thanks for keeping content coming out on the channel and getting some narrations out and everything. I know that people were really excited to see the new narration uh, chapters that you had released. Yeah, and there's um, more was that pretty fun for you to be able to, was that oh, fun yeah. to be able to be back in the saddle for that? Oh yeah, I've missed it. And getting to voice Freddy because I'm still doing the Freddy vs. Ash book. That's a lot yeah. of fun. Yeah. I wish Jason was in it, but it's okay. You know, it's kind of cool seeing Freddy vs. Ash. In the last, uh, in the last narration I just put out, uh, Freddy possesses Ash to uh, read from the Necronomicon, and Ash fights back. So it's Ash punching the shit out of himself while Freddy's like, "Stop it, bitch!" You know, it's pretty. It's a pretty cool scene. If, uh, if we funny. ever do, like, if you ever narrate a Freddy versus Jason or another, or another Crystal Lake book or another Friday the 13th book, can I voice Jason? Yeah. <laughs> You'll hear, that was your head <laughs> talking to the side. They're like, that was definitely Alex. <laughs> that was for sure Alex. I could hear Nailed it. Nailed it. Michael, Nailed hey, it. Michael Clark is listening. He's like, I'd recognize that labored breathing anywhere. That's my <laughs> buddy Alex. Uh... Josh, let's More get coming soon. What? Huh? More coming soon. Okay. Yeah, I'm getting fun. old, man. I'm getting old. I can't even hear it. Let's get into some fun facts, brother. Let's do it. All right, man. Preformationism was the belief that sperm were essentially fully formed miniature people that would grow into a fetus once inside the womb before our scientific understanding had fully evolved. <laughs> I so, got a bingo, slash tracks bingo. I got sperm. I marked sperm off. I got the bingo. Um, pre formationism. So basically, when we're sperm, you are basically a miniature slasher librarian, and I am a miniature Alex. And we full, like we look how we look now, and then we come out of our dad's penis and then we we go what, into go what into the year. age do we look like though I, 37 42 I, yeah, 39 um, like, the, like the little uh jason and uh jason goes to hell that's running around you know it's just a bigger bigger version of the little sperm jason did he have a hockey mask whenever he came out of uh elias Voorhees' dick honey i blew up the womb <laughs> what okay you, let me I think we should move on, Alex, um, to the next to the next thing. Um, do you have anything else you want to say about it? Because I, I got I got a question I got to ask about it. I, I was just I, I thought that that uh, was a great fun fact. I don't have anything else to add to it. Because uh, now all I can picture is like everybody I see, I'm going to see them as like little sperm people. <laughs> so um, I think we should move on. What do you think, uh, jumping Jeff Farmer? Should we move on? Yep. All right. He said, move on. All right. Jump and Jeff has spoken. Uh, Josh, sluggard wakers were church workers in the 18th century whose job was to awaken anyone sleeping in the congregation by hitting them on the head with a stick. And those sticks were sometimes tipped with the brass knobs or forks. So, yeah, don't fall that asleep in church. That sounds like something from like a 1980s Nintendo video game. You have to get a stick that has a sharp point on it, and you have to go around hitting things in the head with it. It sounds like the rules and physics of a, a Nintendo Entertainment System game, maybe one of the Bible games since it's at church. Um, you know, if, if they had given me that role, I think I would have had more fun at church, honestly. <laughs> well, who's paying this? The, who's paying the sluggard wakers? Are, does that come out of the... The collection plate, or is that just budgeted in to the church's monthly expenses? Who pays that person? Uh, I, do they need to get paid? They get to freely hit people in the head with a stick. I mean, is that not payment enough? <laughs> I'd be a hey, if there were if there were sluggard wakers at the <laughs> church that I went to as a kid. I guarantee there'd be a lot less snoozing by me. A lot, dude. Can you? Those little, like, uh, Back to the Future where old Biff is hitting uh, <laughs> Marty on the head with his cane, and it's almost got, like, didn't it have, like, a, a fist on the yes. end of it or something? He was a sluggard waker it, all oh, the way in Back to the Future, too. Yeah. At the Cafe 80s. Uh, Josh, roughly 0.5% of U.S. births 
are from self-reported virgins. That's a lot of messiahs walking around. Oh my gosh. Uh, are they self-reported because they're like teenagers and they're in the like the doctor's room with their parents and they're like, I don't know how this happened. All we did was kiss. <laughs> I'm a virgin. <laughs> this could possibly have happened. I have no idea how this happened. I, I definitely have never had sex, Mom. Or the husband is there, and he's all like, "I've been out. Of t I've been in the. I've been overseas for like six months, and she's four months pregnant. So we've got a bad situation going here, sir. My wife obviously did not have sex and somehow got pregnant. We need to figure this out. She would never cheat on me. Uh, yeah, first never. Of all. Well, there's no way that she would have ever slept with someone else besides me. Um, what was that the name one, of our, our, our subscriber that had a name like a medicine? What was it? Prexera. Prex, Prexera. One of the side effects was unplanned pregnancy. So these are Prexera uh, users. Um, I was going to say, like, if, if it's somebody's wife and the guy's like, <laughs> oh, she couldn't have had sex with So obviously she's had sex with him. So oh, she's okay. not a, he doesn't think she's a real virgin. She's a Christian, and she she's a reborn virgin. <laughs> reborn, reborn. Yep. He, she hasn't had sex with anybody else while I'm on leave, or when I'm on duty, or whatever. She having sex in 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 the you know the other hole doesn't count. She's a reborn virgin. Exactly. And that's Wait, what. <laughs> <laughs> hey, uh, and that's where the episode of Slash Tracks Express number two just got. Uh, uh, hit with a strike or something by YouTube right there. It's like, why do we only have eight views on this episode? <laughs> Wait, Jeff, are we going to get hit with a strike? Yep. Um, okay. Copy, we're get hit with one. Copyright strike on <laughs> anal sex <laughs> jokes. Um, all right. Last. Copyright. Who gets the copyrights? <laughs> we get sued. We get we get a copyright strike by Vivid or Brazzers. <laughs> <laughs> the porn, the whole porn industry, you know. Yeah. Like, we we copyright, we trademark the the uh, you know, the AP there, the the A penetration. So <laughs> that's our intellectual property, you bastards. Uh, last fun fact: Their of lawyers the, are very anal about that too. Oh, of course they are. That they, <laughs> they have guys that are. That's all they do is search internet videos of random channels looking for anal sex references, twenty four seven. Wait a second. What did Alex just say? <laughs> we've got one we've got one get the lawsuit ready now <laughs> all right <laughs> all right last speaking of anal sex uh last fun fact of the episode charlie sheen uh <laughs> once bought 2615 seats at a baseball game because he wanted to catch a home run ball he didn't catch a home run josh <laughs> i bet he didn't <laughs> So, so his plan was buy a bunch of seats and he can just run around when the ball gets hit. Is that what? Was he just running when he's ah? He bought the entire out. Yeah, he bought the entire outfield area of one part of the field and was hoping a home run got hit and he'd get a ball. But he apparently, you know, no one hit one there. I know he probably had a bunch of people out there sitting there to catch him for him. But it just, I just, I just want to picture him by himself in a whole empty section every time the ball gets hit. Ah, and runs in that direction, you know. Just Dude, to... <laughs> we need two and a half men money because that's what he's doing with his money, obviously. I can't believe he showed up for the finale of that show just to get squished, man. That's crazy. Just his legs. <laughs> um, Definitely him. Not not somebody else, for sure. He, Charlie Sheen, like, was one of the first people that I had, uh, like, grow, like, not even growing up because it was, like, 10 years ago, so I was, like, 30 or 29 or whatever. But it, besides Seinfeld... He was one of the first people where I, like, learned about syndication money. It was like, wow, he makes more money not doing the show than he made doing the show. It's crazy. That, that's nuts. Yeah. Yeah. He, so when he got fired for all of his crazy behavior with Tiger Blood and winning and everything, he, what the hell did he care? He was making millions upon millions of dollars just being a crazy asshole, buying the entire outfield at the Los Angeles Dodgers Stadium Trying to catch a home run ball. He's got tiger blood, man. He has no excuse for not catching one. Winning. A lot yeah. of people A lot of people uh, wonder why Jack Black only took $300,000 to voice Bowser when, like, Charlie Day was getting, like, I think it's, like, $1.5 million. Uh, Chris Pratt got, like, $6 million or whatever. Okay. And I think it's because he probably made some agreements, you know, for, like, uh, residuals. Back in. 
merchandise for the song Peaches that he did and stuff like that. I bet he's going to make bank on the back end for sure. Jack Black, um, Kung Fu Panda, and like he's done a bunch of yeah. That was a pretty good attempt at his face, actually, because I knew what you were doing. That was not bad. Um, he's done a lot of animated work. He's he's perfect for that kind of stuff. I mean, he's good in anything, though. I love Nacho Libra. I love... Uh, yeah, Bowser. Oh, my God. He was a great Bowser. Yeah, was- I, like, I like Jack Black and everything, seriously. Um, Josh, let's get into Would You Rather. All right. Here's a Would You, here's a would you Rather question. Would you rather have $3 million today, Josh, in your bank account... Or would you rather have five hundred thousand dollars a year until you die? And that's from uh, Dogan Dogan Goats. That's his name. Dogan Goats or Dogan Gates? Dogan. Uh, Dogan. Dogan Gates. It's Dogan, like a Dogan. Uh, okay. Whatever, like that little Dogan thing. And he also left a nice comment. He said, "I laughed very hard, guys." And he left that comment on uh, the last Slash Tracks news episode we did. I think it was like episode. 30 something or 35 can't can't remember well the last slash tracks was 35 but the last slash tracks news i don't remember what the number was but it was that one okay um i would say if i'm answering first i would say and you're gonna think i'm crazy here but i would take the three million today and the only reason is i have seen in my life actually from the time i was like 14 to 24 four best friends die at a very young age and i'm not getting any younger Mm-hmm. And I think with $3 million, I could, like, take a million, find a really good place to, you know, invest some of that in different places. And I, I think I could make that work. I think $3 because I don't know if I'm going to be here a year or two from now, and that would guarantee I could leave something to my kids. That's a really good question, by the way, uh, Dogan. I uh, thought you were going to say, I know a really good place to dig a hole. I like to bury <laughs> the money. I thought that's what you were I was like, we need to stop recording right now so I can help you learn about financial investments. <laughs> You're like, Alex, I know a really great spot in my backyard where I can bury that money. Well, you know, I could just plant the, plant the seed and you get more, right? That's what the, the, the guy on the church TV show told me. Is that how send that works? Them. If you yeah. bury money, it grows no. more? No, you send them a thousand and then God sends you back two thousand. <clears throat> Because you're so blessed. Because you're you're, seeding it to them, to God. I mean, to the preacher, to God. And they they send it back to you. So $2,000. Those preachers, those mega church preachers, talk (laughs) about hypocrites, man. They're they're flying around in private jets and stuff. Yeah, I know. It's crazy. Yeah, and it's like, send send God your money. It's like, yeah, you're not getting any of that, are you, buddy? (laughs) They have like MC Hammer gold-plated bathtubs and stuff. It's like... (laughs) If I can find the clip, Alex, I'm going to put it here. A preacher, literally, you talked about an airplane. I don't know what his name is. He's one of the big famous ones. I think it's I, like... I, I, I know who you're talking about right now. He's old as shit. He's got not, like... Not the devil. You're talking about Kenneth Copeland. I think he's possessed by the devil. Talking about Joel Osteen? Uh, I don't know. The guy... It might be that one. He's on stage, and he says... I had enough money to buy a beautiful Cessna Citation jet. Cash. And since there's so much jealousy in this room tonight that I can feel over this. A few weeks later, I bought another one worth three times what that one was. Cash. Act happy over my blessing, folks. <laughs> meanwhile, <laughs> meanwhile, most of the congregation is just struggling to, like, put food on the table. Yeah. Um, he's like, Josh, I need you to donate for my next private jet because <laughs> the, the better engine I have, the better jet I have, I can fly closer to heaven, and then I can get your prayer requests closer to God himself. So, Because heaven's in the sky, you know, and jets fly in the sky, so I can get closer, you know. So I don't know give me your ever, money. I think we went a little too far off subject here. Yep. <laughs> yeah, I haven't even answered. I haven't <laughs> even answered. Oh, hey, let me answer really quick. I'm going to say $500,000 a year because uh, I don't exercise every day. To, to die in the next six years. But you know what? Me saying that, guess what? I'm probably going to be the one to go first. Dude, just I might not. I might have cursed you just by knowing me and being my best friend, so just be careful. Oh, get out of here, dude. Um, Okay, but yeah, I'm going to say $500,000 a year. I feel like I could... I don't. I barely have any personal debt, so I could wipe out everything with that, and then everything else is just Gucci. Uh, the, the bad luck for my employer would be that I would no longer 
they would no longer need my services even if they needed them because I'd leave. <laughs> I would buy the place. Yeah. Uh, I, you you know, know, five, is five hundred thousand dollars enough to buy a PJ, a private jet? I don't think so. I, I think don't think it is few, either. Probably. I don't think it is. Just a few million, few dozen million. I don't know. He, yeah. I think one dude said it was like thirty-three million or three million or something. Yeah. One guy said he didn't want to fly on them because it's flying a regular plane because it's like being in the tube with a bunch of demons. I guess we're the demons, but uh, and by the way, people, this is not uh, you don't talk about politics, religion, or whatever. We're not talking about religion. We perfectly respect that, but we're talking about just mean, bad people. Okay, greedy, yeah, bad yeah. people. <laughs> At, like preachers that like okay. I may get some hate for this, but Joel Osteen is a, he's a prosperity preacher. There it is. See me. And if anybody has read the Bible, uh, most of the time, God or God in the Bible, the God of the Bible, is basically saying that, like, you know, it, the way to heaven is, is rough, okay? It's not a fun trip. Yeah. Uh, but prosperity preachers make it seem like everything is just Gucci. Everything's going to be fun. <laughs> everything's great. God's going to bless you. You're going to have like the time of your life just by uh, accepting, you know, Jesus as your savior or whatever. But it's not quite like that. It's totally backwards. And um, I just think it's really interesting that like these guys have just found they're like snake oil salesmen. Today. Yeah, they are. And yeah. they get away with it. And these older people they're preying on lose everything sometimes. Some people yeah. don't even go get uh, medical care. Because they say, don't don't give the money to the doctors, give it to us, and mm-hmm. God will heal you. And that's they uh, that's really happened, people, and it's yeah. that's crazy shit. So I do not feel bad about our last segment, and uh, that was a good question, though, and I respect Alex's answer, and I think I think some people could see it from his perspective or mine. Uh, it just depends on, you know, yeah, so. Well, I was going to say, I really like the question, and also the, the last little thing on the bookend of Joel Osteen. Um, I was going to say, he's a prosperity preacher, he's a millionaire, blah, 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 he's really famous. Oh. He, um, they had a really big storm in Texas, and he wasn't allowing people to come into the church to get out of the storm. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah so that, that's, that, that's, too that's much. straight up fucked up, dude. If that's you're true. if you're trying to help people, but when it comes down to nut-cutting time, you're actually not helping them, I got an issue with that. You know what? I completely agree with you. They are the scum of the earth. And since we kind of got a little serious here tonight, I'm going to put a clip right here of a different preacher. This is Jim Baker, and he had a bunch of buckets of food for like an apocalypse. And he's selling them in like an infomercial on the on whatever channel it was. And he start he goes, you know what? I'm a little hungry. I'm going to taste it. Going, why didn't I order something? I want to eat some more of this. You're not careful. Oh, mm. Mm. It's so good. Oh, my God. <clears throat> you didn't have lunch, right? <clears throat> wow. <clears throat> uh, jo- <laughs> Josh, let's get into uh, Slash Tracks News Sports. <clears throat> All right, Josh. On June 12th, 1970, 53 years ago, Pirates starting pitcher Doc Ellis threw a no-hitter against the San Diego Padres. Ellis later claimed that he threw that no-hitter while he was high on LSD. <laughs> that's, that's my hero right there. That, that, that would be something else, man. That, that's impressive. Hell? That's impressive. How the hell... I mean, hitting the strike zone in baseball, like throwing from the mound or the catcher's mitt and throwing it within that, like, defined strike zone to get a strike is hard enough as it is. Can you imagine doing that while unicorns and rainbows and stars and the toucan from the Fruit Loops box and, like, all this other stuff is fucking flying around? The tricks bunny is jumping around behind you? That's not what he saw. I know how he did it, man. He yeah. looked in front of him, and he was at the – eternal damnation carnival and in front of him was the devil sitting in one of those dunk take dunk tanks you know yeah and there's like god next to it saying if you don't hit if you don't dunk the devil you will not save the world you know and he's just tripping balls and but he had to save that world man he dunked the devil in a water tank and saved us all 
So. He saw he saw the devil from Dirty Work. It's Adam Sandler. Yeah. First you eat the pea, <laughs> That's what and it's... then you burn. <laughs> burn. Uh, yes. Yes. If you uh, if any slashaholics are interested in Doc Ellis's uh, LSD induced no hitter, there is a really great documentary on Netflix available. So uh, I don't know the name of it. I, I saw it back in the day, but if you just Google Doc Ellis's no hitter and look for the documentary. Uh, it'll pop right up. So put it in your Google machine if you want to see that. Josh, in 1974, Nolan Ryan's fastball was clocked at 100.9 miles per hour. So that's 1974. If we were using today's technology that clocks fastballs today with a more accurate reading, that pitch would be an estimated 108.5 miles per hour. What do you think of that? I think, okay, so not many pitchers can throw 100 miles per hour, first of all. Second of all, I think the fastest pitch on today's technology is like 102, 103. Uh, if he got clocked at 108, I, I, I don't know how as a hitter, if you were in the batter's box against Nolan Ryan, that you could even see the ball. So that's, that's ridiculous. Crazy. It's ridiculous. Also, can you imagine getting beamed by that ball? Can you no, imagine man. getting hit by that ball? You know, all you got to do to make sure that don't happen is make sure the pitcher has some LSD. Oh, yeah. Because uh, he's, he's throwing fucking BBs at the catcher's glove. He is uh, <laughs> two can Sam's behind him. The, the cinnamon fr French toast guys are behind him helping him like angels in the outfield. He's got... He's got jumping Jeb Farmer uh, helping him throw pitches. Everybody, dude. Joel like, Osteen. Jumping Jeb Farmer, were you helping him throw pitches? Yep. You're right, he was. Wow. He's, hey, he's got the three Cinnamon Toast Crunch guys behind him like angels in the outfield. They're like, <laughs> Cinnamon Toast Crunch. All right, Josh, last sports episode. Count Chocula. <laughs> yeah, but he, Count Chocula can only help you for a limited time. <laughs> he's only able to help you for three months out of the year. Um, Josh, this is the last sports Sports story. What do you have in a final destination thing? What the hell's wrong with you? No, you're like, okay, Josh. And I'm like, yes. You look like you were having a final destination thingy. I did. The show hasn't even started yet. I just saw all of it. We have to start <laughs> over. I, you, saw, you saw the whole show to this point, and you're like, you don't laugh at any of the other shit because you've already seen it. You're like, it's just old hat now. Josh, last sports story of the show. Okay. You're like, Alex, I don't want to hear it. I already heard it. I just saw it. Um, okay. So, Pete Alonzo, slugger. Slugger. Stud, first baseman for the Mets. This is a quote from him, Josh. Uh, I said, I don't care where this pitch is. This at bat is going to end on the first pitch because I really need to go to the bathroom. As soon as I touched home plate, it was straight to the bathroom. And that is Pete Alonzo on hitting a home run after the, seeing the first pitch, after he drank one too many cups of coffee before a baseball game two weeks ago. Oh, God. So he ran home and then ran straight to the bathroom? Yeah, he was going to shit his pants, man. So, so he, he was didn't like, even stop to like, yeah, you know, he just... <laughs> he was, he's, he's running down the, down the thing like with his legs like all the way apart, bow-legged, just running as fast as he can. He shit his pants. I almost, dude, I almost shit my pants running the other day. I don't know if I told you about this. <laughs> I, like, went to the bathroom before my jog because if anyone runs, we've talked about this. When you go running, it shakes things up. You got to go to the bathroom. Well, I went to the bathroom before I went. Then I go out. I'm, like, half a mile into my run, and it's like, I got to go to the bathroom. The only way I'm going to get home without crapping my pants is if Christopher Lloyd from Angels in the Outfield flies me back to my apartment. Dude, I was running... I was running like I had been riding a bull for like, I was running like with my legs out like that. Like I almost crapped my pants, Josh. I haven't crapped my pants since I was like three or four years old, dude. Well, sharp, man. That's crazy. Yeah. Uh, I, I, uh, this is the last one I promise Alex, but uh, as far as crapping yourself goes, uh, Jeff, you ever done that? Yep. Oh, wow. Okay. That, I hope it wasn't in a wrestling match. Which happened to me one time. My opponent was wearing diapers. I did not know. Yeah. Wrong wrestling story. bashed in booger, Josh. 
the guy was really wearing a diaper. I had no idea. And he filled that diaper after I uh, landed on him with an elbow drop. So, yeah. Oh, yeah. I hit him with the big elbow drop, and then he just shit his pants all over the mat. Yeah. Hey, I got it for you. And it was stinking, stinking, stink. Do it. Stinking. I was stinking, stinking, stinking. Yeah. I hit him with the big elbow. And I said, Hebner, get over here and count. I can barely stay on top of him. For the three count, because he smells like shit. Yeah, dig it. Hey, Josh, let's get into, hey, great segue. Let's get into wrestling. Let's do it. You ready? All right, man. In June 1991, over 32 years ago, WWF WrestleFest made its official debut in arcades, the United States and the world over. Do you remember the arcade game WrestleFest? Yes. Did you did you like playing that game, Josh? Yep. <laughs> yep. Yep. No, uh, uh, yeah, I love wrestling arcade games, man. Especially like that one. And uh, was that the sequel to WrestleMania that had all like tombstones and shit? And then WrestleFest had less or something. No, um, WrestleMania came out in like the mid '90s. WrestleFest oh, was okay, a, okay. WrestleFest was like straight to the arcade. You could play as like Legion of Doom, Demolition. Uh, Earthquake, Sergeant Slaughter, Hogan, Warrior, Macho, whatever. But it was like the graphics were incredible for 1991. You could use their finishing moves. Um, They had a great tag team format. They had like little segments, like little cutaways with Mean Gene, like interviewing the wrestlers. Okay, I think I I actually do remember the Mean Gene thing. Like it was still animated though, right? It 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 was animated, but it was just, it was... Chef's kiss. As an eight-year-old, that was amazing, dude. I, I used a lot of quarters on that. That that actually took the spot in my local arcade of Double Dragon. So when Double Dragon moved out, they put WrestleFest in. Yeah, I'm looking at the graphics right now. I remember that because I remember a few years ago when WWF Superstar, WWE Superstars came out for like the 360 and stuff. Yeah, I said it felt and looked a lot like WrestleFest, so I do remember that. Oh, uh, just a Wrestle- modern version. Yeah, definitely. That was one of, that's like one of those items, like if I did get $500,000 a year, that would be one of my first purchases is uh, the, the cabinet of WrestleFest. Yeah. For sure. If I, if I ever did a collection, it would be a video game collection. And I would like do like a wrestling collection too. But I would love to collect the entire, not the entire, not the super rare. I'm never going to pay like $5,000 for a cartridge. But for the main... To do a collection of the main Nintendo <clears throat> Entertainment System uh, game collection. That would be the one thing I'd love to collect with some uh, wrestling uh, memorabilia, especially wrestling arcade games. Yeah. Uh, WrestleMania was great uh, whenever, you know, like fucking Undertaker shooting the, the tombstones. Do you remember that one? I do. I, I would do. say that's the second best one. I remember that game just being hard as shit. Uh, it was really difficult to progress in that game. But the graphics... Fast. The graphics for WrestleMania, uh, the game you're talking about, when that came out for Super Nintendo, it blew my mind because it was great. Who are we kidding, dude? We were playing WWF Wrestle Challenge and Steel Cage Challenge or whatever back on the Nintendo, and we thought it was the coolest shit we'd ever seen. Hulk Hogan was, like, picking up little crucifixes in the ring. They, like, bounce in the ring. Oh, WrestleMania, yeah. 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 In the original game. Andre the Giant, I can't remember what his thing was. It was like, was it a singlet or like a... <laughs> I'll have to look. You know what? That's yeah. a research thing. Million Dollar Man, money, obviously. Uh, Please stand by. was a massive foot for Andre the Giant. You knew that the whole time, didn't you? I knew it the whole time. I just wanted you to check. So I I wanted to make sure I actually knew. And I wanted to know if you knew, because I knew. You know what I mean? You know, Alex is the best uh, podcaster in the world. If you don't believe me, ask him yourself. He'll tell you. (laughs) Josh loves his jokes. Just ask him. Hey, I'm not the only one that loves them. Don't you love them, Jeff? Yep. See, I told you. 
Uh, hey, him on. Enough, for, enough with Jeff. We're going to get into the second wrestling story of the episode. Ready? Eh? All right. Ju- uh, on Friday, June 16th, would have been the Ultimate Warrior's 64th birthday. So Ultimate Warrior, if he was still around, would still be relatively young. Uh, what are you, do you have any thoughts or fun memories of the Warrior? First, I'm going to give my, my true heartfelt one, and then I'm going to give the one that makes it seem like I have no heart. First off, it's crazy you brought that up because I'm rocking Ultimate Warrior right now. Um, as a kid, I loved him until he beat Hogan. I rented uh, Hulkamania, I think it's like three or four or something, where it has that match, and that was the first time I saw it, I think. And Or I rented WrestleMania you know, and saw it. But um, when Ultimate Warrior beat Hogan... I started hating the warrior because uh, as a kid, Hogan couldn't be beat, you know, and uh, I, I kept telling people Hogan kicked out, Hogan kicked out, he kicked out. And now looking back, it's just him making sure he doesn't get destroyed character wise. He kicked mm-hmm. out after the three count <laughs> like a, like a dick. Um, but uh, that and being then, said, and then handing the belt personally to the warrior. Oh, but Hogan will tell you now he wanted to turn heel that night, you know, Back in 1990, Hogan, sure, Hogan, like, yeah. right. You don't right. want any of that, you don't want any of that sweet merch money from being a baby face. Sure, Hogan. You're going out to do a movie career, but you wanted to turn hill first. That way you definitely not sell any tickets to the movies. Um, yeah, so Ultimate Warrior, he was a great force in wrestling. He defined an era, in my opinion, not always in the best light possible. And uh, his, when he showed up in WCW, I've never been more hyped in wrestling than I was that night. Even though I ended up hating the storyline, hating the rematch, I will tell you that night when he came out on Monday Nitro to talk for like 12 hours, it blew, it blew my mind. I'm not even joking. When his music, I didn't recognize the music, but when Hogan said he beat, he's beaten every whatever, every, every warrior, I was like, oh, wait, he never did beat Warrior. And then Warrior comes out. It was just, it was amazing. The crowd, if you watch it on YouTube, like not WWE's version, but like just a random person that uploaded that segment, it's popping like nothing you've heard lately in, in wrestling. So he did, he did put butts in the seats. Yeah, he was a, he was a draw. Um, I was going to say when the Ultimate Warrior, one of my fond, I have two really fond memories. Obviously, uh, <clears throat> when he, when Honky Tonk Man issued the challenge, like an open challenge at SummerSlam for anybody uh, to come down and challenge him for the IC belt because Brutus Beefcake was injured, so he needed an opponent. So all of a sudden, Ultimate Warrior's music hits, and he destroyed the Honky Tonk Man in like 17 seconds, won the IC belt. That was amazing. The crowd popped louder than any pop I've ever heard probably in my life. WrestleMania eight, when the Warrior came out to save uh, Hogan, from Sid and Papa Shango, yeah. and then WrestleMania 12, when Ultimate Warrior showed up, uh, came back to the WWF, and defeated Triple H in like 20 seconds. Yeah. Um, I know he gets a lot of he got a lot of shit because he wasn't a technical wrestler, but the way that he was presented and his character, I don't really know what else they could have done with it, and the way they did present him was perfect, especially for a, a kid. Uh, yeah. He was like a real superhero, like an actual superhero that you could like see and touch and like jumped off the pages of a comic yeah. book. I don't know how to describe it. Um, it's funny. He even had a comic book in the mid-90s that they sold at wrestling shows, you know, at yeah. WWF. So yeah. that's crazy. Um, it's funny you brought up Honky Tonk Man. I'm not going to go into details. I'll save it for our next show when we have more time. I got to meet the Honky Tonk Man recently, and I'm going to give you my full report, uh, Slashaholics, in the next episode. And uh, don't meet your heroes. Yeah. Spoiler alert. He's a dick. Uh Hey, I'll, can I tell you something? Since we're talking about Honky Tonk Man, I met Greg the Hammer Valentine, the other part of Rhythm and Blues. Nicest guy I've ever met in my life. Uh, talked with me for like an hour. Uh, really funny, charismatic. Uh, you would not think Greg the Hammer Valentine would be charismatic, but he's really funny. He's down to earth. Like it, yeah. And he has one of the biggest hands I've ever shook in That's my life. That's the hammer. The hammer. It's the no hammer. joke. Yeah. yeah, hell of a guy. He was making fun of uh, Eddie Munster at the booth over at the Eugene Comic Con. It was hilarious. 
Um, Josh, you were going to say something. We're going to put a button on the Ultimate Warrior story, but you were going to say you said the positive. What was the negative you were going to say now that you're older about the Warrior? Oh, the negative was first, as a kid, he beat Hogan, and B, it was finding out uh, that he was a hardcore jerk and kind of a bigot. Not kind of, he was a bigot. He did. Yeah. He actually did speeches where he was horrible towards the LGBTQ community and everything like that, and said some really nasty things. But I will say, when I watched his documentary, him coming back right before his death, it seemed like he was a different person and that he was really trying to mend fences with people and make some wrongs right. So he won me back in the end um, almost completely. But there is that one part of him I can never, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, support or whatever. You, I yeah. can never stay with that. Just because we forgive him doesn't mean we can forget it. Because that it is a piece of his history. I mean, it's something that uh, made up who he was. And <clears throat> I, I did see that Dana, his wife, um, they were really good friends with a gay man uh, later when they lived in New Mexico. Yeah. And Warrior was really good friends with him. Um, and it was all behind the scenes. They didn't like, it wasn't like Warrior was, it wasn't like a PR stunt. He was actually friends with this man. Um, and I think Warrior did have uh, a change of heart towards the end of his life. But sometimes when you do stuff like that and you say those sorts of things that are hateful and, and a lot of people are not going to forget it. So can, can, I, can I end the warrior talk on a, on a funny note real quick? Absolutely. OK, I think it's funny. If you don't leave us a nasty comment, tell us not quit our day jobs. Um, I was watching a video, a short on YouTube, and it was uh, the entrances uh, from Monday Nitro or Thunder or whatever. No, it was Nitro. Warrior didn't do very many Thunders. It was going to be Ultimate Warrior and Sting versus Bret Hart and Hollywood Hogan. And the reason Bret Hart always tagged with Hogan and WCW is so Hogan didn't have to wrestle Bret Hart and WCW. Um, but uh, anyways, they did the entrances, and somebody replied saying, Oh my God, Warrior and Sting versus Bret Hart and Hogan. I got us. Where's the match at? And I replied to the comment and said, That's the match, pretty much, yeah. I, th I think those matches with Warrior lasted about two seconds before it got thrown out, you know, like DQ or yeah. run-ins. He never wrestled a match, people. Uh, so, yeah, if you, if you watched it back in those days, you know the entrances, that was about all you were getting out of the Warrior until uh, Halloween Havoc. So, Nitro, um, towards when, when the Warrior made his deb debut in Nitro, Nitro was at the point with their shows that, it was really lazy writing. There, there was hardly the only people that were actually having really good matches were the cruiserweights um, and the lucha libres and like guys like Jericho, Benoit, uh, Guerrero, Dean Malenko. All those guys were like carrying the bulk of them. Alex Wright, um, those guys, and then all the main event guys. I swear to God, Josh, like the NWO had like forty guys. They had more guys in the NWO than are in like a Royal Rumble, and they would all have their NWO shirts on. They'd show up. I don't even know that they had written a speech or anything or anything it's planned. <laughs> yeah, they would just go in the ring and just kind of whatever, man. It yeah. felt like high school. They were the cool the gang. kids. <laughs> yeah, the NWO is supposed to be a small group that destroys the big corporation, and then it they just everybody joins it. That's how they destroyed WCW. They just everybody left WCW to join the NWO. Yeah. Uh, you know, we, we bitch on Hogan all the time. I actually saw a short, and I'm going to send this to Alex tonight, uh, where uh, Bubba the Love Sponge, which is like a fanatic for Hogan, like he's Hogan's biggest fan. Hogan was on there uh, the night after Chris Wall beat Sid Vicious in 99 for the WCW title, and then showed up at Raw pretty soon after, you know. And uh, Bubba the Love Sponge was telling Hogan, yeah, did you see the pay-per-view last night? He's like, no, what happened? He goes, Sid dropped the belt. You'll never guess who they gave it to. It's so stupid. And Hogan's like, who? And he goes, I'll give you a hint, five foot eight. He goes, oh, Benoit? And he's like, yeah. And he's like, oh, that's cool. He's like, I didn't think Benoit wanted it. He goes, uh, he didn't. And he's all like, don't you think that's so stupid? It's so unbelievable. And Hogan goes, no, man, brother, I wouldn't want to get in a fight with him. Like, yeah, he, he was he he wanted Hogan to sink Benoit that night, and Hogan wouldn't do it. It was actually pretty cool. Bubba the Love Sponge is the guy who Hogan slept with Bubba's wife, and Bubba's the one who, like, released the sex tape. Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah, Bubba, it's like, Bubba, totally, like Bubba totally screwed him over. Uh, they're not friends anymore. But back in the day, 
they were like best friends. This was way before Benoit's whole thing, people. I'm not I'm not taking up for Benoit. I'm saying at the time, for Hogan to take up for somebody like Benoit, it's unheard of. And he if you listen to it, he really threw a lot of respect to a younger talent and uh didn't didn't let Bubba bait him into it. So Hogan Hogan okay, so the last thing I'm gonna say before we get into the final wrestling story. Hogan takes a lot of shit for people saying he didn't put people over or he not that doesn't work for me brother or whatever if you go back and watch uh old like nine mid 90s late 90s hulk hogan stuff i would say he lost probably 70 percent of the time um he lost all the time to the new blood in wcw do you remember him losing to billy kidman like three times i watched it live yeah. Well, I, no, when I watched it, it was a pay-per-view. He beat him. But, like, before that, Kidman had beat him. So I mean, yeah. he lost all the time, constantly. Uh, when he came to WWE and he Hulkamania was reborn in, like, 2002, he lost to The Rock. He lost to Kurt Angle. He actually tapped out to Kurt Angle. He lost to Brock Lesnar. He lost to everybody. Yeah. Um, Hogan gets a lot of shit. And Hogan put over Ultimate Warrior clean when Hulkamania was basically at its peak at WrestleMania six. So, come on, dude. Um, Good turnaround. Hulk, Good turnaround, man. High yeah. five. Ow, God, dude. What the <laughs> hell? Hey, man. Lap. Hey, man up, dude. We got one more wrestling story. God, you didn't even swing your arm. June 13th, 1993. Over 30 years ago, Josh, Bret Hart wrestled three times in one night to become the WWF King of the Ring. Sure did. That was an uh, amazing night. Yeah, so that was the anniversary on um, June 13th, so last week, like eight days ago. A um, couple thoughts on that before we go into horror. I'll get mine out, then you can say what you think about it. Uh, we went a little long on the rest Let's of the Let's call this an episode at the end. We'll re-record the opening. <laughs> yeah, we went a little long. Um, I was going to say, Bret Hart, at that time, when he wrestled Razor, Perfect, and Bam Bam, all in one night, he had three very distinct different matches all in one evening and basically cemented himself as the greatest performer in the world wrestling federation at the time which is ironic josh and very poignant because on that same pay-per-view hulk hogan wrestled yokozuna and had one of the shittiest matches he's ever had on the same card against uh and he lost because harvey whippleman dressed up as a photographer like threw a fireball from his camera into his face and then Hogan got pinned and then Hogan like immediately went into retirement uh, afterwards and then he showed up in WCW like a year later but if you were watching WWF at the time and you saw what Hogan did that night and you saw what Brett did that night it was pretty obvious who was the better performer at that ex- in that moment of time it should have been Brett Hart beating Hogan for the belt that night honestly yeah, he didn't. Uh, Hogan Hogan refused to drop that, the title to Yoko. That would have been not, the Yeah, that would that was that was the night though. I'm pretty sure that was the night that they wanted Hogan and Brett to you know come to a head at, and uh, it just uh, Hogan wouldn't do it. So they went off in different storyline directions. The uh, the night the actual night that that was supposed to happen uh, was SummerSlam. Oh, SummerSlam. And yeah. They, Duh, they actually, yeah. Josh. They actually had publicity photos of, like, Brett and Hogan having a tug-of-war over the belt. Um, and they're, they're, those photos are hidden somewhere in Titan Towers. I've never actually seen the photos, but Bruce Pritchard has stated on the Something to Wrestle With podcast that those photos exist. To, uh, I've seen the poster. You know, there's a poster out there that I thought was fake at first, but it was real the, for SummerSlam, a mock-up they were going to do, and I think yeah. that's what you're talking about. Um, but two quick fun facts of King of the Ring of that night, and we'll move on. Hogan was in his notorious no steroids phase because, you know, he was yeah. very skinny, wearing the leg, wearing the pants and shit, I think. And also uh, for the pre-show or during the King of the Ring that night, they did a cutaway to Jim Hart as Hulk Hogan's manager doing a promo, you know, where Hogan's like, sitting over here, you know, doing this while Jimmy's talking. He's all yeah. showing the 24-inch pythons, you know, and uh, <laughs> yeah, show off what I, the little bit I got right there, you know. It's like, come on. Um, so anyways, Hogan is doing that, and Jimmy Hart gets on the microphone and says, this man was uh, born and bred in the USA, red, white, and blue, running through his veins. He starts spouting off what would become the lyrics 
of Hulk Hogan's WCW theme music. <laughs> he wrote the WCW theme at a WWF pay per view. Yes, he. I'll find the interview for you sometime. But yeah, he's on the he's on the mic. He's like, uh, he's got the red. Oh, listen here, baby. He's got the red, white, and blue running through his veins, baby. Okay. He was born and raised in the USA, baby. So I can't go as high as Jimmy Hart, but you know, it's whatever. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so before we get into horror I just wanted to say one last thing about that King of the Ring thing it's like so it was like okay so Hogan is a champion because he screwed Brett over with the finish at Wrestlemania 9 where he shows up and beats Yoko in like 9 seconds after Brett just dropped the belt to Yoko and then you know Hogan has this shitty match at the King of the Ring yeah exactly <laughs> and then Brett goes and has three amazing matches with three vastly different opponents, steals the entire show, becomes the king of the ring, and then to reward Bret Hart for what the show he just put on at King of the Ring, they put him into a feud with Jerry the fucking King Lawler. It's like Vince McMahon booked Bret so weird. Like, he'd book him really strong, he'd win all these great matches, and then he'd have him feud with, like, Isaac Yankum or Jerry yeah. Lawler. Who needs to be a jobber when you're getting a Vince McMahon push in the early '90s? Like, and now it's just your your career's not gonna. It's gonna be the exact opposite of what the crowd wants. It's just so, so dumb. Um, let's get into Slash Tracks Horror. All right, these are both Robert England related horror news stories, Josh. I'm scared. All right, Dwight, you ready? I'm just getting it dark in here for the horror news. Man. Yeah, set the mood, dude. Set the mood. Dwight H. Little, director of Halloween 4, The Return of Michael Myers, is now at work on Natty Knox. And this is starring Robert England alongside fellow horror icons Bill Mosley and Daniel Harris. So Robert England is going to be in a new horror movie. Um, so Daniel Harris, you know, she's in Hatchet. She's in all the Halloween movies. She was in Roseanne. Uh, I thought she was hot when I was a kid. She was in an episode of Boy Meets World. They Wasn't she like Harley? The Connors. They killed yeah. Connors. Wasn't she like Harley's sister on Boy Meets World or something? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Yes, yes. Or Griff or Harley. I can't remember something which one. Like, yeah. um, but hopefully this is actually a horror movie and not like a horror comedy. Because whenever I see uh, Daniel Harris like in an, a new horror movie, it's usually not like straight horror it's like kind of hatchet-esque maybe yeah um so like, here's like robert here's, campy shit yeah it might be campy so here's robert england he's filming a new horror movie and here's our next ho uh horror story uh robert england says he is done playing freddy krueger and he said this seventy thousand times so it's not really news it's just news in relation to the fact that he's filming a new horror movie so he says i'm too old and thick now so he's basically saying he's overweight I can't do fight scenes for more than one take anymore. I've got a bad neck, uh, bad back, and arthritis in my right wrist. I have to hang it up, but I'd love to do a cameo in the new Nightmare on Elm Street film if there is one. So it's like, are you too old to film a horror movie, or are you not too old to film a horror movie? Because you're the, filming one right now. Yeah, do, do the voice lines. We've come so far with stand-ins and CGI and all that and close-ups. Nobody would ever even flip and know, man. Like, uh, yeah. the Bloomhouse guys said they can talk him into it. So they said if, if, they, if they made a Nightmare on Elm Street remake, or, or if they made a movie for Nightmare on Elm Street, they would skip all the sequels, it would be a direct sequel to the first movie, and they would get Robert England back. They said they could do it. So maybe they will. If they, I've said this before, if they did a direct sequel from the 1984 masterpiece, Nightmare on Elm Street, and they jumped straight into like 30, 40 years later, and Nancy and Robert go at it again, kind of a la the Halloween 2018. Perfect. That would be like printing money. I don't know why they haven't done that yet. Just do it. Do it now. Uh, don't, you know, don't pass go. Don't collect $200. Go do it. Make some money, dude. This is yeah, stupid. Don't regret it. Like they did with Ghostbusters, man, when it was too late to have Egon. Yeah, you know, Harold Ramis. Gone. They were trying to film Ghostbusters 3 years and years and years ago, and it just got stuck in development hell. And Harold Ramis and Bill Murray, towards the end of their friendship, weren't buddies anymore. Yeah, it was uh, because of Groundhog Day. They got into it on Groundhog Day. That's just unfortunate, because those guys were like best friends for their entire career. It was just ridiculous. Good news, though. 
Dan Aykroyd has confirmed that in Ghostbusters 4, which is dropping this December, Ooh, which there's going to be a great chance Ecto Cooler is actually coming back permanently because there's a new movie and two new cartoons and an animated movie of Ghostbusters coming in the next two years. And uh, Dan Aykroyd confirmed Bill Murray uh, himself, of course, Ernie Hudson and Janine, or Annie Potts, are all returning. And Walter Peck is going to be back. And uh, Patton Oswalt has joined the cast. So it is true. This man, The man has no dick. And uh, come come December, Ghostbusters 4, and it, part of it's going to be in New York. They've been spotted filming there. Slimer's back. And some of the movie takes place in England. I think it's going to be great. What do you think? I just hope the judge is there. The Scalari brother! Yeah. I, bring them all. Uh, bring them all. Slimer, I wish we could get Rick Moranis back for more than just Shrunk. He's going to come back for the Shrunk reboot. Let's get him for Ghostbusters. Rick Moranis is like... He's an enigma wrapped in a riddle, man. Like, he took care of his kids. He kind of, like, walked away from Hollywood. And I think Rick Moranis just kind of does what Rick Moranis wants to do. And yeah. he's a legend. Regard Like, if he never made another movie again. He made the movie Big Bully with Tom Arnold. One of the worst scripts probably ever made into a film that actually went to the theaters enjoyable for me. Like, I actually will watch Big Bully anytime it's on TV. Do you remember sure. that movie at all? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Cheesy uh, che uh, Cheetos puffs, and he calls him a, a pussy for ha not having the crunchy ones because he had the Cheeto puffs. Do you remember that? Yeah, he's, I mean, he's Fang. He's got a gold tooth on his or whatever. I don't know. That that movie's great. Tom Arnold is also slept on. I think Tom Arnold is hilarious. I really like he is, Tom he is, he is. He He's kind of a shitty person, shitty human being, but he's got some good movies and stuff. Um, I, I never – have, where have you heard that? I've seen that he's He was like, very verbally and, and – abusive to Roseanne back in the day. Like it okay, was maybe. They're verbally and physically. But I uh, know that um, back in the day when he was on Roseanne as Arnie, his character, um, what, I, what a great... Yeah, he hey, was on there because he's jealous. I was just going to say he was married to Roseanne and it was almost like he probably had them write him into the show because he's married to her. Yeah. Um, they also have one of the worst cameos in the history of horror movies, uh, the Nightmare on Elm Street cameo. Yes, oh my Freddy's God. dead. It's, it's like, it was almost like, okay, we're going to, it wasn't organic. It was like, okay, here we have Tom Arnold and Roseanne for the day. Uh, we're just going to kind of put them into the movie with really no reason for it. Just other than for fans to see that it's them. And having Johnny Depp be Johnny Depp, that was stupid. You know, <laughs> have him be the character. And Glenn? He, you know, he gets eaten, he gets pulled, you know, like blood comes out the TV or something. I don't know, something better than what they did. There's a hey in Dream Master, uh, Tuesday night is in her bedroom and she's got like a Teen Beat or Tiger magazine or whatever Tiger Beat uh, on the cover of the magazine is Johnny Depp. Ah, good catch. Good yeah. Catch. Uh, in the script for New Nightmare, Johnny Depp was supposed to be at the funeral with everybody else uh, when they, her husband dies. They couldn't afford to pay him for that cameo just to show they, up in a suit. They wrote him in the script. So apparently they, they thought they'd get him there, but they didn't. How great would it how hey, how great would it be if they had a, a <laughs> they reshot that scene? <laughs> like you know how George Lucas goes back and remasters his old Star Wars movies? And they they slip Johnny Depp into the new nightmare funeral scene, but he's dressed <laughs> as Cap he's Captain <laughs> Jack. I was about to say that. Just, <laughs> or he's just back there getting the crap beat out and by Amanda. Yeah, no. <laughs> Amanda Kruger or Amanda Heard? Amanda, both of them. Both of them. Uh, let's get it. Hey, so final thoughts on Robert England. I think he's full of shit, and I think if they paid him enough money, he'd do it. Yeah, I do too. I think Bloomhouse will get him. They'll get him. Good. They're making a Dead by Daylight movie. I, I can't believe that. It's awesome. So Yeah. We're going to saw... we're gonna have to add a Josh's gaming section. Go ahead. No, I was just going to say I saw that too, and I'm excited about that too. Yeah, that's going to be cool. Uh, let's get into headlines to end the show, man. Let's do it. All right, uh, so it, we're getting to headlines right now, but before we get into the final part of the show, uh, go to slash tracks2020 at gmail.com. If you want to be part of the show, the next show, uh, go, ahead, go ahead and send us a Dear Slashy or uh, you know, a Would You Rather question, or if you're a company, or if you're somebody that's selling something or whatever, and you want to partner with the channel or the program, uh, send us an email, send us a question, send us a pitch for one of your products that we can partner with you, slash tracks2020 at gmail.com, or if you just want to talk with us. If you like the content, you think we're funny, you don't think we're funny, we need to stick to our day job, go fuck ourselves, whatever. Uh, you don't want us to talk about anal or mega, mega churches, 
Give us a call. Uh, not a call. Give us an email. We're actually, I'm looking into getting a voicemail line for us for the show. Oh, cool. Hey, we I can saw, play voicemails and stuff. I saw a podcast, uh, True Crime Brewery, that does that. And those are really fun because they actually allow the listeners to be part of the show. It's And it's just, that's, a, a, yeah. That's something I'm looking into for us. And, yeah. Let's do uh, that. yeah. Um, okay. Also, you can if you donate certain uh, number amounts to the channel to help the channel, uh, you know, keep going because that's the only, the only way we make money here is through possible sponsors and uh, through you guys signing up on Patreon or donating on uh, PayPal uh, because we can't monetize the channel. All the movies we've ripped, all the clips we've shown, the songs we use, and also once you're a YouTube partner, we can say this without worrying about because we're not one. YouTube puts a stop to monetizing your videos if you talk about 90% of the stuff we talk about on our shows. So yeah. we would have to be, we would like, wouldn't even be able to be what artistically expressed, what we want to do. It would be watered down and that's never going to happen. But we need you guys to make sure uh, that we keep going. And if you would like to actually appear on one of the shows or pick what movie we riff or review, uh, you can donate uh, 50 to a hundred dollars to the channel and uh, from there to 100, you can either appear on the show or pick what we watch and uh, review. So, Yeah, I was going to say um, we had two or three different donations at that tier uh, where we're actually going to have Michael Clark is going to riff with us uh, the next Slash Tracks episode. And we've actually had people pick the next movies that we're going to do. So that seems like a popular choice. Um, and we appreciate anything. So even as low as a dollar, we both have families we both have day jobs uh so we can't quit those just yet <laughs> uh so we got to keep going uh so anything helps uh josh let's get into headlines for real this time baby let's get into headlines for real baby with the american dream <laughs> son of a plumber jumping jeff farmer baby and yeah. the road warriors new third tag team partner from <laughs> parts unknown baby Shit. Stinking, 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 yeah. <laughs> it's going to be the American dream and shit versus Duke the Dumpster Drowsy, baby. Dukey the Dumpster Drowsy. <laughs> drowsy. Uh, <laughs> He's not headline. drowsy. Uh, <laughs> airline to weigh passengers, Josh, before they get to board the flights. Mm -hmm. So there's going to be an airline that, that's going to weigh you before you get on the plane. Uh, Air New Zealand passengers flying out of Auckland International Airport are set to be weighed before boarding their flights. And they're claiming uh, it's a passenger weight survey, and it's a measure by, by the aviation authority to collect data on airplane weight distribution. Any thoughts, Josh? If it's in New Zealand, it's not going to be that big of a deal. Sadly, if they did that study here in America it would probably have results that would embarrass us as a country. We're the only country that really has all-you-can-eat buffets and stuff like that. You go, you go overseas, you're not finding that. Like in, in like England, for instance, there's no all-you-can-eat anything. What about Italy? Have you seen the meals they have? They have like eight courses of like six different pastas. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. But they don't have the buffets where you can just like pile up your plate ten times. <laughs> oh, America is like by far probably one of the fattest countries. Um... I was going to say, can you imagine if they didn't just weigh everybody and it was like just randomly selected by TSA? And they're like, uh, a fat person like walks in the line. They're like, you've been randomly chosen to be weighed before you get on the plane. And you're like, oh, randomly, really? Okay. That's it's cool. like when I had to run the kid, my kids to Walmart one time. Uh, we had to go in a hurry because my daughter needed a certain over-the-counter medicine when she was small. I was in my pajamas because she, she, she had a fever. And I had to rush over there and get it. She's like in uh, like a, a little uh, onesie. My son's in a short set um, pajamas. They were like little two and four or whatever. And I happen to be the one that's randomly chosen to have my bags checked when I leave. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I look all ratty and stuff. And it's a random bag check, you know. And it's like, oh, uh, so that's what that sounds like to me. Imagine being the person that has to stop people. And it really is random, okay? But, like, for some reason, every time it gets to that random number, it's somebody that you don't want to, like, make them feel like they're random. Yeah. Or oh, yeah. Make them feel like they're not random. You're like, what the yeah. hell, man? That's like the tenth one. This isn't fair. <laughs> I hate confrontation. I could never do that job. No. no. I, 
I bartended for years, and when it was time to cut somebody off, I would feel like physical anxiety. It's like, I'm going to have to cut this person off. I'm going to have to be their guy. I'm going to have to be their daddy here, and they are going to hate me. Yeah, I couldn't do it. I, yeah. I, I, I couldn't I couldn't even beat write tickets as a cop to, to most people. Some people sure, but most people I I know how much people are struggling and I just couldn't be like, Well, here's a two hundred dollar ticket for going six miles over the speed limit. <laughs> Hope you can pay your rent next month. Or it's like your tags are expired. Uh you probably have expired tags because you can't afford new tags. Here's a ticket that costs more than the new tags. <laughs> yeah. Enjoy that. Ridiculous. That's a whole uh, other subject. <laughs> hey, speaking of people being overweight uh let's get into mcdonald's new promotion for this month okay grimace the grimace. overweight purple monster uh mcdonald's is celebrating his birthday and they don't say when his birthday actually is but it's this june apparently so it's this month and they rolled out the grimace birthday meal so josh and i are actually going to head out and get the grimace birthday meal right after we're done filming uh you can get a 10 piece oh, nugget or a big mac <laughs> fries and a medium grimace shake it's and actually shake, got real grimace in it yeah it's got pe ground up pieces of grimace uh yeah. and it's purple it's got some whipped cream on top uh josh what the hell is grimace flavored shake i always assumed he tasted like a plum whenever i was a kid so i don't know maybe a plum shake I don't know. I don't, dude. I I don't know what he tastes like. They didn't really <laughs> specify. And also, McDonald's is having big time issues with this, Josh. For the over the month that this has been a promotion, there are certain McDonald's franchises that haven't been able to price it correctly in their POS computers. So, like, there's Grimace right there, buddy. Uh, it's his birthday. Go out and get a Grimace meal to celebrate his birthday. But some of the McDonald's can't price it correctly. So they're, they're like overcharging. Like some, some of them are charging like 1999 for this thing. That's supposed to cost like nine 99. Whoa. So, wait. Yeah. You're saying that McDonald's, the restaurant. Yes. Is overcharging for the food they sell. Yes. It's documented. Holy shit. Breaking news. Breaking news. They overcharge. Like I, shit, you know, overcharging for their food their food's not worth what they charge that's crazy i never would have thought that would happen <laughs> you're not getting value for your buck um dude and McDonald's, ba, 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 you're eating it sorry <laughs> mcdonald's if you ever are having a problem going number two just have some mcdonald's trust me go out for a jog yeah go out for a jog afterwards you'll be trying to you'll be almost shitting your pants in no time you'll be pulling a pete alonzo from the new york mets in no time get that get uh, that uh, hot mustard and sweet and sour sauce. Dude, hot mustard. I love hot mustard. I dip my fries in it. And Nicole, my girlfriend, just recently got me some hot mustard flavored Doritos. Oh, wow. They are fucking delicious. Do they have a Lestra in them? Or are you crapping your pants from that, too? Or are you I don't just know crapping what they have. Every day. <laughs> Dude, I wish McDonald's still, still fried their fries in beef tallow. I like wish the they still had the non- fat. The non-fresh meat was better. I'm sorry. Like, whenever it was frozen, it just tasted better. Um, it tasted like childhood. <laughs> yeah, it did. And and the old nuggets that had the rib meat in them, so it's like part white meat, part brown, way better. I, dude, every once in a while, you'd get a dark nugget, and it was really? just... Yes, yeah, like back in the day. Yeah, they'd have the whatever, zoo, zoo animals. They'd grind <laughs> up zebra and shit. You know what I'm talking Grimace about? Slime. Grimace slime. <laughs> yeah, they actually grind up Birdie and the fucking Hamburglar and Grimace and Mary McCheese, and they put them in their nuggets. Yeah. Um, Josh, but I was going to say before we end, uh, end that story, uh, so McDonald's is having pricing issues, and some of them are just not celebrating Grimace's birthday anymore because they can't price it correctly. The, there's some sort of glitch. I'm so, sure the world is, is just devastated. Uh, mm -hmm. That some places aren't uh, celebrating uh, uh, an imaginary creature's uh, some number birthday, but you know, I'm, dude, I'm surprised that um, Grimace what, they're even doing this promotion because they kind of phased out, and they McDonald's they kind of phased out those mascots like ten years ago. Like you don't really see Grimace or Birdie anymore on any commercials. The Hamburglar was back last month or the month before uh, about like reaching out and grabbing hamburgers again. Maybe they're slowly trying to bring them back. Okay. Seeing how it works, you know. McDonald's? Yeah. Dude, when we were kids, McDonald's was like a destination. Uh, birthday parties, uh, the ball pit, the, the play place. It was a really fun time. Now McDonald's, the way the building looks, 
I feel like I could go and get my taxes done at McDonald's. It looks like a McDonald's, fucking H&R Block. McDonald's, back in the day, looked like a happy, excited kid looking forward to growing up and having a wonderful life. And McDonald's today looks like a 38-year-old person that has lost the will to live. Like, that's what McDonald's looks like if you look at their buildings compared to back in the day. Yeah. And, you know, I remember going in and buying VHS tapes like Adam's Family, uh, Value, Wayne, uh, Land Wayne's Before World. Time 2. Huh? Wayne's World. Gremlin, Gremlins, you know, uh, Money Pit and stuff. And it was Dr uh, Jurassic Park. When it, that was one of the first. I think that's where we bought our VHS copy of Jurassic Park. Uh, the Flintstones, they had those glasses. Those were great, man. Those little, we still have those in storage. McDonald's was like the shit. Their cups, they had little promos where it's like, you'd get like whatever movie or whatever thing was going on, you'd get an extra value size cup if you supersized it. I still drink out of a lot of those cups from the early 90s. Remember the Power Ranger and VR Trooper Pogs? Of course I do. Yeah. Of course I do. Uh, I just recently bought Rocky and his Ape Zord uh, off of eBay the other day. Still packaged, thank you very much. Whenever I was 11, I didn't know that they just did promotions there, you know, like with the Pogs. And I was collecting them. And I was a very emotional child. Like, I wore my heart on my sleeve. I might have been a little autistic and just didn't get it diagnosed. I don't know. But I didn't <clears throat> handle change and losing things very good. And uh, I was bullied, so that might have played a part. But those Pogs, I was so excited to go to McDonald's because every time we went, my mom let me get, like, two of them because they were, like, 75 cents extra to get extra ones. Yeah, And I had all but, like, one pack of Pogs. I had all of them. I just needed three more. One side's Power Rangers, one side's VR Troopers. And uh, we go in to get another one, and they had quit giving them. They quit selling them. Dude, I was crushed for, like, a week. Cried yeah. about it. Not, not cried because I was spoiled, but cried because I didn't understand. You know, I was, like, I was so close to getting it. And it was just – but they were awesome. Uh, great memories with those. I was uh, – speaking of Pogs, uh, Pogs – I don't know if you guys remember, like, I know what we're talking about, but Pogs were, like, little circular things, and you'd have, a, like, a big heavy one, and you'd, a slammer, you'd toss it on top, they'd flip over, whatever ones flipped over, you lost them. Uh, I never Pogs, bet the Power Ranger ones, never, never. Pogs were super popular at my grade school for, like, half a year, and there was some little asshole that lost their Pogs and went and told the principal, and then the principal outlawed Pogs for everybody, for the entire oh, school year. Yeah. Dude, I, I can do you one a little better, a little embarrassing story for you. I had a giant tubes of Pogs. You know, just the random ones you can go to Walmart and get for like five bucks? Yeah, it's they'd like have skulls, skulls, and they were like peace signs, and they were like bedazzled yin-yang yeah. shit. Yeah, I had those, but then I had my good ones like the Power Rangers, the VR Troopers, uh, the ones you get out of the machines going out at uh, like um, Walmart or grocery stores. They had oh, beautiful yeah. signs. So those were the ones I kept. And then I'd take the other ones to school, the giant tubes of random shit and my slammers. And this kid wanted them, and he had $50 with him that day, and he bought the Pogs from me. <laughs> and I had, and I thought I was a millionaire, man. Fifth grade, fourth, is fourth grade, fourth or fifth, 50 bucks, man. I'm, I'm the richest guy in school, you know. Go home, go to school the next day, and I get called into the principal's office, and... My mom's sitting there, the kid's sitting there, and the kid's mom's sitting there. The money was for, like, a field trip or something that he was supposed to pay for. So Damn it. I have to give the money back. I get the pogs back, and, like, 20 or 30 of them are missing, and I never got them back. But at so least he you, didn't have my good ones. You lost out on the money, and you had to reverse the deal, and you didn't even get all your shit back. No, I lost at least 89 cents worth of pogs in that deal, man. Damn it. <laughs> Damn it. Uh, I, Josh, let's get into the last headline. Well, actually, before we get into the last headline, you had a headline about uh, Mario? Yes. Uh, this is Josh's video game corner. You know, Dead by Daylight is uh, getting a movie. And my favorite game growing up, before Ocarina of Time became my favorite game, because that one kicked ass, was Super Mario RPG, The Legend of the Seven Stars for the Super Nintendo. It was made at the end of the Super Nintendo's life cycle. It was 1996. They used the Super FX chip. Uh, so they were able to use, like, 3D rendered uh, sprites and make, like, they, they rendered 2D sprites into 3D. It made it look like a 3D game. If you look at this game, it's, like, one of the best-looking Super Nintendo games they ever did. 
And uh, the N64 was already out, I think, when this game came out for the Super Nintendo. Okay. Uh, fun fact, uh, 1999 and 2000, or 98 and 99, NHL put out games on the Super Nintendo. <laughs> I had no idea. They did that all the way up until almost the year 2000. I didn't know that at all. I didn't either. I didn't That's know crazy. that. Breaking but, news. Yeah. Uh, but Mario RPG was made by Square and Nintendo. Nintendo was real bad about... Uh, not letting other companies get involved with their, you know, their intellectual properties, but they really loved the final, uh, final fantasy games that Square put on the Nintendo and Super Nintendo. So they struck this deal with Square, and they made Super Mario RPG. Well, afterwards, Nintendo had their falling out with Sony over the Nintendo PlayStation. Yeah, that it could plug into the bottom of the Super Nintendo. There's a slot still on the old Super Nintendos that was meant for it. Uh, they, Nintendo went with CDI anyways, we all know that story, and Square and Nintendo went their separate ways, and uh, until recently, they didn't work together again. Today, on a Nintendo Direct, they announced uh, they're doing a complete remake, remaster, of Super Mario RPG, and uh, what's got me excited about it is this, we've been, we've all, all the fans have been asking for this, or a sequel forever. Uh, and because Square and Nintendo broke up, they ended up uh, making, they were in works on an N64 sequel in the year 2000 called Super Mario RPG 2. But that's when they broke up and Nintendo started over from scratch and we got Paper Mario. And Paper Mario was fun, but after like the second game, they dropped the RPG element. And there was a uh, handheld series called Mario and Luigi. It's an RPG series, but sadly, that one after five games as well uh, has ended because the company that was working on it, developing it for Nintendo, went be belly up bankrupt. So all the RPG fans of Mario were, were like disappointed. Today, they announced the sequel. Uh, it's the exact same game, 3D graphics, HD, all that. Um, what's got me excited is I think Nintendo is up to something more because they had to go through a lot of hurdles to make this remake, and I just don't think they would do that just for one game. And they dropped the Legend of the Seven Stars from the title, even though it's the same game, same story. And that makes me think maybe they're setting this up as their new Mario RPG series, and this is their way of bringing interest, interest back into the game. Okay. And if it does good, I bet we're going to see like a sequel. And that's what's got me excited, because the fact that they did this remake as much trouble as it would take to get it made seems like they've got something else bigger planned uh, after it. So if you're a fan of Super Mario RPG, the remake's coming, and I'm hoping within a couple years a sequel. Yeah, so. that might be their way of like dipping their toe into the the pond and see if like there's enough interest to like yeah. re reboot the series. Yeah, there was a petition a few years ago that had tens of thousands of signatures for a sequel. Uh, to that game, so maybe that that got them thinking, you know, and they're gonna see what happens. Dude, couldn't couldn't be a more perfect time with the Super Mario Brothers movie having such such major success. I mean, seriously. There's there's a, there's a Super Mario Brothers five coming out this year too, brother. It's called Super Mario Wonder. Uh, it's not part of the new Super Mario Brother games that have been yeah. coming out. It's uh, it's pretty much a sequel to Super Mario World. It's the Dude. next game in that series, and You're that's gonna. You're speaking my language with that one. I love me some Super Mario World and Mario Brothers 3. Uh, you know what else I'm excited about, Josh? What's that? Last story of the episode. I'm excited that 82-year-old Al Pacino is expecting his fourth child with his 29-year-old girlfriend, Nor Alphala. So 82-year-old Al Pacino uh, got his hot-ass 29-year-old girlfriend, Nor, pregnant. What's your thoughts, Josh? She might be one of those versions that have been getting pregnant. You never know. You know what's going to happen, though? Besides, like, him not making it to 12 years, or the kid, uh, the kid's dad not making it to see the kid's 12th birthday, probably. Or maybe even the kid's 6th birthday or 5th birthday. All I can say is I want to be in the hospital when he's born, when the, when the, when the kid is born. You know why? Why? Because I want to hear from all the way down the hallway, say hello to my little friend. And, uh, you know, or no, that's... when the baby comes out, hoo Hooah! <laughs> Josh, end the episode. Let's end the episode. Thank you all so much for watching. I've had a blast getting to get back on here. Uh, thanks, thanks for 
watching. Uh, this was supposed to be an express episode. I think now it's become a full episode, probably episode 26. Is that what we're on? Uh, I, don't know if, I don't know what number <laughs> it is, but we'll tell you what the number is when we reshoot yes. the opening. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, be sure to check out our Patreon, patreon.com forward slash 80 slasher librarian, or donate on PayPal, daylighter07 at yahoo.com. All the information is below. Uh, the email is slash tracks 2020. We went over that. It's been on the screen throughout the episode, I'm sure. Be excellent to each other. Have a good night and a pleasant tomorrow. Say good night, Alex. Good night, Alex. Mahalo, dog. You've got me mad now.